Hello, everyone. Welcome to the voice technology in startup, in your startup session. I have the speaker here, Philip Likens. And uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Chase, Downtown Dallas, uh, Velva Wood, Touch Titans, Dev Mountain, Circes, Credos, and many, many more. And a special thanks to the deck for providing the space for today's session. And I'll pass the mic over to Philip. Uh, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, a little louder. Okay, I'll try to, I'll try to speak loudly too. Um, <laughs> uh, so my session, voice technology in your startup, I think uh, I kind of threw that title together a couple months ago. And now looking back, it reminds me of uh, the files are in the computer, like voice technology in your, st uh, sorry, so sorry about the title, but, um, but I am here to talk about voice. Um, how many of you are involved in a startup right now? So, okay, most of the room. I, I'm actually surprised, um, but pleasantly surprised. Um, okay, so, that, so that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, so I'm here to talk about voice and your startup and kind of the momentum that's building around voice and the possibilities where I think it's kind of headed. Um, and so we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, first, I want to show you a couple commercials. So this one is a Hyundai commercial. So those are a couple examples of uh, voice technology kind of in the eye of the public. You can see, you know, the Amazon Echo commercials are still continuing now. Uh, I see Jason Schwartzman and um, Shatner like all over the place. Um, and, uh, and I think Amazon's put kind of a, b a big bet on voice. Um, but my, in my talk, sorry, I'll try not to stand in front of the projector. Um, this is the outline for my talk, okay? Voice is a thing you should start investing in within the next 18 months, and here's what has helped me. So that's kind of what we'll uh, cover today. Um, uh, this slide is, is just to trigger me. Um, so I'm Philip Likens. I've been doing design for about 15 years. Recently, I've switched over to uh, research uh, with future technologies and where that intersects with travel. So, um, so I work for a company called Sabre who, that rolled out of American Airlines back in the day. Um, 
semi-automated reservation system, something or other. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, it was basically the switch to from handwritten airline ticketing to computerized airline ticketing. That's what our company is built on. So we do software and um, distribution for hotels and airlines and things like that. I work in Sabre Labs, which is focused on future technology uh, up to 10 years out and how that's going to impact travel um, for us and for our customers. And so I, I started um, doing design for them three years ago, and I've recently switched into more of a research role. Um, so design background, future focus. Um, and we found that voice was a really big thing for us. So um, it, it, it became, it was increasingly apparent that voice was going to kind of be a foundational shift uh, for software. Um, and not just in the consumer space. So you see it a lot in the consumer space right now. Um, but, but we have, we're kind of betting on it long term. Um, for business just kind of all across the board. And so uh, started doing a lot of research on it, and that's what I want to share with you today is kind of our outlook on voice. Um, our team has built uh, about five prototypes using voice. So it started with Google Glass. We were building a Google Glass app, voice search, uh, flight search for Google Glass. And we realized, oh, um, this is actually harder than we thought it was going to be um, because we didn't get the voice interactions correct. And then that's when we kind of started going, oh, voice design, that's probably a thing. Um, and it's probably a different thing than what it used to be because, uh, well, it used to be IVR. So you'd call into uh, some uh, help system or customer service line and they would say, say uh, yes if you want to talk to a customer representative. And you'd say, Yes, right? Yeah, it's terrible, right? It's a, those are, uh, many of those systems are terrible. Um, uh, and that's kind of what I had in my head, but this is, this kind of new era of voice is different than that. Um, and so you have to kind of adapt to new skills. And so since then, uh, since the Google Glass app a couple years ago, we've tried a bunch of different things. We mostly build prototypes because we're a labs group, um, short time on, on a lot of different things. Um, but we've done stuff with Cortana, a couple of Amazon Echo apps, and an iPhone app. Um, so, um, so that's kind of my experience. I've helped design some of those and, and things like that. Um, again, I work for Sabre. We're hiring. I have to say that. Um, so if you are looking for a job, come talk to me. Okay, so uh, voice is a thing. So that's my uh, thesis here. So. Who uses voice um, at least uh, once a week on their phone? Kind of maybe half the room, okay? Daily? A little less? All the time? <laughs> um, does anyone have an Echo or an Apple TV? Amazon Echo or Apple TV? New version? Okay. Um, does anyone use? Uh, voice anywhere else in their life? Where? Okay. 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 Cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, a lot of people have used it in their car. If you have a fairly nice car, it, it, a lot of them have uh, voice capabilities. Um, okay, so, so voice is a thing. My question to Siri was, uh, why didn't you exist before 2011? And she said, I'm here. So uh, I don't know what kind of answer that was, but um, typical. Um, voice to me is basically four different things. And you could slice this a bunch of different ways. I've sliced it into these four these four sections. So um, it's one, speech recognition. So the ability to recognize what you're saying um, and translate it to words. And this was the focus of most of the technology development for voice um, for 50 years, from 1950 
to 2,000. Um, this was the focus. And that's basically all you need to start taking voice commands. And that's what those IVR systems generally are, is their voice command system. So um, you say operator, and it takes you to the operator. Um, it's a word for word, um, give me a command, and I'll do the thing. Um, the next piece is understanding. Um, so this is going past um, what are the words that you're saying, but what do those words actually mean? What are you trying to get at? What is the human trying to say with the words that they're using? So this is NLU, uh, is an industry term, natural language understanding. And it's a way to bridge words to meaning. So you can create kind of a language model uh, for whatever you're um, designing. Um, and, and that's kind of the way that all this gets translated. Um, a good modern system will fill in some gaps for you. So uh, we created uh, an app, and you could say uh, competitors, and it knew that you were talking about your competition. Competitors, competition, those are different words, but that, that understanding bridges that gap. Does that make sense? So you don't have to straight program all that. We've got some machine learning and stuff uh, in, in, uh, in modern systems. Uh, the next piece is uh, language generation. So this isn't a great example of it. Um, you know, all IBM Watson is doing is putting it in a question form and saying, uh, who is Bram Stoker? Um, but uh, natural language generation, I think this is the, the part that we know le the least about. We're, we're not as far in this part as we are in other parts of uh, voice. Um, and it's really hard, but we're starting to see glimmers. Um, so you've got some uh, companies doing natural language generation for like news stories, uh, spe specifically in like sports or fantasy sports. So I played uh, Yahoo um, uh, fantasy football this year. Every time, uh, at the end of every week, it would give me like a recap that was auto-generated by some computer somewhere, um, but it, it was a recap of the week um, that I had. So, but this is what you need you need that content creation piece, piece, that generation piece, to have a good conversation. Otherwise, you're kind of hardwiring everything in. Um, and we're, we're kind of limited right now in that respect. And then the last piece is speech synthesis. Um, so the, the ability to uh, generate words uh, from a computer system to speak back to the human. Um, and that's not something that you have to have, but um, that's, that's a part of of this whole area. Um, and, uh, and really, I kind of I always wondered why R2-D2 didn't speak, but C-3PO did. Um, it's obviously obvious that they have the technology right. Um, some of you probably know the answer to why that is, but um, uh, I think what's interesting is, especially with Amazon service right now, you can design the way uh, the Amazon Echo or Alexa reads back the text that you put into the system. So you can design the spacing of the words and the pronunciation and everything. And I think that's a, um, that shows that we're getting a modern way to do voice, uh, to do voice systems. Um, okay, so those are kind of the four, the four pieces um, recognition, understanding, generation, and synthesis. Um, why haven't we had this up until now? Well, uh, you can go back to 1979 and um, Xerox PARC, uh, everybody knows Xerox. Xerox PARC was in uh, Palo Alto, Palo Alto Research Center, PARC. Um, and they're doing all kinds of computer stuff. Um, Steve Jobs uh, got an investment from Xerox and as part of that investment, he got access to Park, and so he went out there to see what they were working on, and he saw the graphical user interface out there. I assume that he saw uh, conversational interfaces. I assume that he saw voice while he was out there. Um, it's, it's something that had been kind of uh, in, the, in the public's eye for a while, and they were working on it at the time. 
But obviously, that didn't come into the computer systems for a while, right? It was 2011 before we got it in a really meaningful way um, with Siri. Um, but it all started, I mean, it probably all started before this, but really it all started in the 50s with Bell Labs. In 1952, they had this Audrey system which could recognize single digits. So these are kind of the maps of single digits if you say them. So seven has kind of this unique way the frequencies go. Um, and so single digits. So they were, what they were trying to do is they were trying to make a voice-based calculator. Um, and uh, later on in the 60s, they added, um, IBM added like plus, minus, that kind of stuff. Um, but that's where you started getting speech recognition. In the 60s, though, the major, I think the major um, kind of movement in the 60s was that you got uh, voice applications in science fiction, which kind of popularized the idea, and it was in a really popular, or in a really positive way. So um, the, the interactions that the humans had with the voice systems was positive. It wasn't like the voice systems are gonna take over the world. It was, <laughs> it was helpful. So you had, um, this is Rudy uh, from the Jetsons, and that's George Jetson's computer. And he would sit back and he might press a button or two, but he would talk to his computer. And his computer was actually very defensive of George. Um, and then you had Star Trek, of course, um, where they would talk to the computer as well. Um, in the 80s, That is awesome on so many levels. Uh, <laughs> but that's where they were in the 80s, OK? Um, you had to stop after every word, or else it didn't know that you were done with the word. Um, uh, Dragon did some really amazing things in the 90s and uh, into the 2000s to, um, to move kind of the needle forward. But I would say 2008. Uh, Google released a voice search app for the iPhone, and they changed the model. So the model used to be uh, you're going to speak into your computer, and that, that computer is going to process everything. And what Google did was they said, you're going to speak into your phone, and we're going to use that unlimited data plan that's attached to the iPhone, and we're going to send everything to the server, to, and the server is going to catch all this and learn from it, um, and then it's going to send back a response. And all of a sudden, now, now you can start making like really big changes um, in, in the learning and, and the advancement of the algorithms and all that stuff. And so that's, that was a much better way with cloud processing and all that. Um, and then, you know, then now you get Amazon Echo, um, you get mobile, watches, tablets, computers, you get your car, um, specifically in the medical field. I have a friend who's an ER doctor. He uses voice all the time. That's the way they take notes um, because they find that uh, doctors don't do very well uh, writing things down. And so it's better to have them speak. It's more effortless. They get better notes on the patients. Um, and then they tra translate all that. Um, so. Uh, the Echo and a Apple TV are examples of in-home. But that's kind of, you'll notice all those are consumer-facing. There's not a lot on the B2B side. Um, but that's kind of where, or not all those are B, uh, 
consumer facing. Medical is not, right? That's a B, B2B thing. Um, but the rest of it's consumer facing. Um, but we're starting to get some momentum there. I mean, everybody has a smartphone now for, uh, I mean, most everyone has a smartphone now in the United States. Um, so most everyone has access to this technology. Um, in 2015, Google did a survey of uh, voice, uh, how people are using voice. In teenagers, um, 13 to 18, uh, use voice daily. More than half of them use voice daily. Um, and then adults are around 41%. And this was in 2015, so it was about a year, year or a so, year and a half ago or something like that. Um, so people are starting to come around to it. Um, in addition, uh, you saw like error rates for voice really drop. So in uh, 2012, um, Google was around like 80, uh, let's see, 81% uh, um, correct. So 19% error rate. And from t uh, 2012 to 2014, they went from 19% um, error rate to like 7% error rate. So part of it, I mean, there are a whole host of reasons why that happened, but that, that error rate driving down um, is, is going to drive use up because people are gonna have better interactions with, with the technology. Yeah, yeah, that's in the US, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and that, I mean, that's an interesting, that's a whole interesting topic. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Amazon, it's interesting because Amazon, um, so the question was, is that English? Yes, it's English. Um, Amazon has chosen to go deep on English um, specifically, uh, whereas some of the other people, uh, like Google, have used other languages as well. So um, it's interesting. Um, and then if you just look around, you kind of see that people are starting to use voice. You, you see it in public. They're talking to their phones, and they're not talking to someone. They're talking to their phone to put something on their calendar or look something up. Um, it happens with my family all the time. Um, and, uh, and, and that might be because they have fat fingers, like they can't, they can't hit the keys very well or they can't see their phone very well. Um, but um, one of the most interesting things, one of the most interesting cases, I think, is uh, Baidu, which is a company uh, kind of like Google in China, has a pretty robust voice system. Um, and they're seeing a lot of uptake in people who uh, are illiterate, but still smartphone owners. Um, so that's the way that they can access the internet, is through voice. Because they can speak, they just can't read. Um, so, so anyway, so I hope I made some sort of case that voice is a thing. Um, now, I, I hope to make the case that you should start investing in it in some small way. Um, this is the dog from Up, and if you remember it, uh, he sees a squirrel and goes crazy, and it's about distraction, right? So distraction equals death, especially in a startup. I know that. Like, it's really, so it was really hard for me to go, okay, I'm gonna go talk to startups about voice and I'm gonna try to convince them to use voice, but do I really believe that? I don't want them to die, you know? Like I don't want them to be distracted and go try to do some voice thing um, to their death, right? Because really your core is somewhere else. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> it's up to you whether you wanna use voice or not. Um, but I think there are some reasons that you should put a big bet on voice. I think it's a pretty sure bet that, that voice is gonna play out over the next few years, um, and there, there are some reasons to do that. So, um, uh, so I think that voice uh, represents the next kind of fundamental shift in UI. So we went from like interacting with computers with cards, which was really, um, uh, not intuitive, right? You punch, you used a punch card and you put it in the computer and ran the numbers and whatever. Um, then we went to like keyboards and mice 
and that's, that's a little bit more intuitive. And now we can touch things, and that's pretty intuitive um, because we, have, we all have fingers, we can touch um, directly, direct input. Um, but I would argue that voice is, is even more natural. Now, it's not always the best use case, right? Like, if it's, if it's really crowded or noisy or whatever, you may not want to use voice. I understand that. But just as far as a natural way to interact with things, um, there are very few things that are as natural, come, come as naturally to us as humans than voice. So I think it, I think it makes se sense that if the technology can get there, we as humans will use it. Um, so I think, it's a, I think it's a foundational shift. I think it's a foundational shift because it changes the way that you design um, and it changes a little bit the way that you build software. Um, and I don't know that people have thought that all the way through yet. Um, I don't think a lot of tech, um, like technology, uh, um, like technology groups in companies have thought through what are the, what are the implications for voice. Um, when I think through uh, the other foundational shifts in UI that are coming up, I, I think about AR and VR, that could be a thing. Um, I think about hardwiring into our brain somehow. That's where we just think and stuff happens. Um, that seems a long ways away. I don't know if that'll ever happen. I don't know how that happens. Or maybe super predictive AI. So it'll, the AI just kind of knows what I'm going to do, and so it can kind of set things up for me. Um, but, and, and there are probably some other shifts in there that, I that I'm not thinking about. But voice seems like a very kind of foundational shift among those. So, um, and I think it's worth building an early competency uh, on, this, on this foundational shift. So what does voice give you that um, you might not have right now? Well, the, it gives you the ability to run software or run commands hands-free or to be able to multitask. So one of the um, uh, voice applications that we did was using Amazon Echo, and it was for uh, hotel managers. And um, so the hotel manager could come in in the morning, they could log on to their mail or whatever it is that they're doing, but as they're doing that, they can, they can interact using their voice with this other system and say, hey, how is my hotel doing against my competitors today? How many rooms have I sold? How many vacancies do I still have? Let's go ahead and run that promotion. Um, so I, I, can, I can do that as a hotel manager while, um, while I'm doing other things during the day. Right? I can be looking at my email, but I can do this other thing. Um, I put uh, physical impairments in illiteracy. I talked about illiteracy, physical impairments, like uh, disabilities, um, people who can't see the screen um, or whatever. Um, I put promoting laziness. Um, but we like things that help us be more lazy, right? Um, if it's easier for us to do, that's what UX is, right? Um, uh, that, that's, that's probably good. And the last thing I put on there is augment, not replace. So I don't believe that uh, voice is going to replace much of our software, but I think there will be room for uh, voice to augment much of our software. Um, three main models, listening only, uh, graphic or graphic plus voice response and voice plus app backup. So listening only, this is a an example of um, a wrist-borne device called Capture, and it captures the last minute of audio that has gone on around you, and you can replay it. So it's just it's kind of just this this capture device, but it's it's listening only. Okay, um, you can imagine another listening system that would uh, be in a call center that would listen to what's going on on the call and listen for product names or whatever it is and start uh, queuing up the system to help the employee in the call center better serve the client. Um, so there are ways to use voice to just recognize what people are saying and start queuing up uh, commands. 
They're graphic and graphic plus voice response. So um, your phone is a prime example of graphic or graphic plus voice response. If I say something to Siri, sometimes she responds back to me. Sometimes she just shows me search results. Sometimes she shows me the weather. Um, um, so that's one model. And then in the last model um, that I see a lot is voice plus an app backup. So with uh, Amazon Echo, I can ask the Echo to play music or whatever, but all of the commands that I give it are also in an app that's on my phone. So I can go look and see what songs it played or what I ask it, um, and I can actually control it via that app as well. Um, and that's, a, that's an interesting model. Um, okay, so why should you invest in it? It's a foundational UI shift. It gives you new capabilities and different models to play with, um, including what I would call uh, uh, Cheetos mode, which is this, this voice only. I can give it a command, and I don't have to touch anything. Um, so why now? Why would I do this in the next 18 months? Um, technology has hit an inflection point. Um, there are a whole host of reasons. I'm not going to go through them all. But basically, battery, microphones, noise cancellation, Moore's law, network speed and bandwidth, advanced algorithms, deep neural networks. Like, all of this stuff has kind of come to a head to make uh, voice recognition and voice, um, like, all those technologies uh, are making voice possible right now. Um, it's still early, so uh, it's still early on in the process. So um, over the next 18 months, if you choose to, to um, work with voice in your product, you're still one of the first people um, to the show. Um, it's in cars, it's in a few products, it's in the phones, but it's not integrated very, very much yet. Um, it'll start becoming that way, but it's not yet. Um, we have massive smartphone adoption, which means everybody has experience with voice. Um, companies are investing big. So, for instance, Amazon uh, has the Alexa Fund, which is a $100 million fund to fund startups um, who are doing voice work uh, on their platform. Um, and then uh, I, th I think an interesting point here that I don't hear talked about a lot is the behavior is being legislated. So very... Uh, it's not very often that uh, legislation comes through that says, um, or laws are passed that say you have to use a certain technology. But if you're in your car and you're in a certain city, you have to use voice technology. You cannot, you, you cannot touch your phone, right? Uh, or you'll get a ticket. Um, and, and that's just an interesting, like, uh, the, and, and that's, that's actually impacted me. That's impacted the way that I use my phone in the car. Um, and I think it will impact other people as well. And then lastly, there's just a wide, wide open B2B market. So there's not a lot of B2B software right now that uses voice, and I think, um, I think there should be. So uh, if you want to do design and development, on platforms, Nuance, Amazon, Android, Microsoft, IBM, uh, API.ai, all of these have um, ways to get started with voice, depending on where you want to do voice. Um, Amazon and API.ai and IBM will all kind of let you do it wherever you want to, Nuance as well. Android, obviously, on Android phones, tablets, things like that. Microsoft, again, on their product lines. Um, and we've used uh, Amazon, Android, Microsoft and API.ai specifically in, in Sabre Labs. Um, so how do you get started? Uh, you're in this UX design session, what do you do? Well, first of all, use the technology. I kind of put this up there as a joke. Um, not very many people have Windows phones. If you have a Windows phone, Cortana is great. Um, if you don't, Siri um, or Android. Uh, but use that technology. Get an Amazon Echo and try it out in your, in your home. It's, it's just an interesting interaction. Um, my son, he's a three and a half. Um, every day he runs up and he tells Alexa the most important thing that happened that day to him. Um, and Alexa never responds at all, really. It doesn't know what to do with, you know, whatever he just said. 
Um, but uh, but he's excited to play with it, and it's just that's just a different thing. That's a different way of interacting with computers than we did in the past, right? Um, this is Hound. Uh, the reason why I put this up there is not because it's like a uh, a much better or much more brilliant way of doing voice, but what's really interesting is. Um, when you use their app, it seems like it's a ton faster than Siri or Android. But if you put it side by side, it's not. So, um, or at least in our tests, it wasn't. So they're doing some UX and some design that makes it feel faster. And part of the, that's the way the speed of the voice response, like they sped up the voice, like the actual voice that's responding to you. Um, but, um, but it's an interesting contrast. And so you can kind of go through the, the apps that, um, um, that exist and, uh, and look at the differences and see uh, how people are approaching um, voice design. There are a few resources. Um, uh, there's a link at the end of this talk to the talk, so you don't have to try to copy any of this. But Amazon and Microsoft both have really good guides. Um, I went to... Uh, the O'Reilly Design Conference in January in San Francisco. And there are a couple of talks. Um, the Fundamentals of Voice Interface Design um, was a workshop, and she works for Nuance. And so it's about their platform, but it's a really good workshop just on voice design in general, too. Um, and then How We Talk to Machines and Listen by Abby Jones. She works for Google. It's more about how we actually speak um, which I don't know, I didn't know anything about, um, and then how, uh, how that works with computers. And so um, you can actually buy like the proceedings for the whole conference if you want, want to. Um, you might be able to find them online somewhere. Um, but those two talks, there isn't a lot out there like that that I've found that's really helpful. Um, there aren't very many like O'Reilly books or anything that help you kind of get started. You kind of just have to get started um, and make mistakes and learn. Um, so, and, and to that point, like, I, there aren't a lot of things that I can tell you um, that uh, will help you along the way. Like, I can tell you we, um, we named one of our apps Lulu, and Lulu is terrible to say and try to invoke as the name of a program, like, with voice. So don't do that. Use some hard you know, consonants or something like, we name the next one Eva, because that's much easier to say. You know? um, there are some like, little tips like that, but, but until you get into it um, and you try to do uh, you know, flight search using voice, and, and you start doing a search like, uh, I think I just, yeah, sorry. Um, and you do a search like, um, uh, find me a flight from DFW to SFO June 4th through the 6th, uh, and it needs to be nonstop. Like that pause, that uh, just totally toasted the machine. Like the machine has no idea. Um, and so you've got to do this multi stage thing. And so, but it, it's really by getting in there and doing it, by building something that you'll, that you'll actually learn those kind of specifics. But what I'm here to tell you is that. Um, the technology is there. Uh, the consumer adoption is there. The investment from really large companies is there. Like, it's all kind of coming to a head. And so the time is, is right to learn this stuff and kind of get ahead of the curve. Now, whether it's right for your startup or not, that's a whole other question um, that you have to answer. Um, but I think it's, I think it's interesting. Um, All right, um, last thing, I was gonna promote Hack DFW, which is this weekend. You could build something there. Um, you can register or sponsor. It's a big hackathon here in Dallas. Um, one of my colleagues who works with me at Sabre kind of puts it on with a big team. Um, so anyway, so that's my talk. Thank you, and here are the slides, if you care to get the slides. So um, thanks. And I think that's basically time, but if anybody has questions,
can ask a question. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question is, um, biometric security for voice, is that a thing? Whatever happened to that? Um, I, I don't know um, specifically, like really in depth. I haven't done a lot of research on it. Um, we're, we've done some research on biometric security, and it doesn't seem like people are taking that up as much. Um, and I don't know if it's because it can be recorded easily or something. Um, yeah, I don't think that affects it as much. I think, yeah, 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 whether you have a cold or something. No, I think it's still fairly good. Uh-huh. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think that, I mean, I'm starting to see content, context engines appear as a thing that people are really working on. Um, obviously, like Google Now is, that's what they're trying to solve is, I'm going to try to get context down so I can, I can better serve you. So they've got this like, this, this voice track and they've got this context track and they've got this like AI you know, deep learning track. And yeah, I think it all converges at some point. I don't know when that is, but I agree. Like that's the holy grail is when the, um, the computer actually understands context. And that's why, um, you know, Apple TV, they re-released it this last year. Uh, just, just being able to say, hey, show me all the Friends episodes. Okay, on, show me the only the ones with this certain person in it. Like, just the fact that it understands that conversational context was really important. Like, that's a signal that we're starting to, we're starting down that path. We, yeah, we're not there, um, but I think, I think we're starting down that path. We're starting to think, of, think that way. Um, but I agree. I agree that, that it's important. Um, that contextual piece is really important. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, Andrew Wynn, I think is his name, uh, went from Google to Baidu. To, to, yeah, yeah. Um, I think he said that like they're they're right around um, or better than human understanding of speech. So 
our error rate is somewhere in the 90s probably, right? Uh, probably high 90s, but it's probably in the 90s. I'm just in speaking to each other and not understanding. Um, and so what I don't know what the statistics are. I haven't seen statistics on their system. But what he said is it's as good as or better than human. Uh, in theory, yeah, that's what, that's what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. There there are some things out there that do that. I don't know off the top of my head. Skype is working on real time translation stuff. Um, which is interesting. Um, it's not that exact use case, but the idea that um, two people who don't know the same language can speak in their subtitles in real time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Right, so message-based versus voice-based conversation. I think I think it's similar in that, like you're always you're gonna choose a tone for your bot, and and things like that. Um, people speak differently than they type, and so fundamentally, what I, from what I've heard is, like the people who have tried to take. Um, a chat system and port it over to voice, it doesn't work because it's just it's just different. Um, people use different words and different, you know. So um, so I think they're related, but I, I think they're also different. Yeah, conversa conversational UI is a big thing right now, kind of emerging, and it does cover both of those though. It's um, and the idea that you can start a chat with a bot and it could turn into a chat with a human, or it could turn into a call with a human and have these warm handoff things. Like, that's really interesting and something that we're looking at, too. Um, so yeah, that's all I know. Yeah. Any, yep. Yeah. So, how does our how does our lab work? Um, we um, we look at kind of a bunch of technologies. We we track a bunch of technologies that we see impacting the world over the next ten years, and then um, we try to partner with business units to figure out um, they may have a business need and and what's the right technology to address that. Or if we see a technology that's going to disrupt something, how is that going to, disruption going to happen? And try to talk to them about it. So that's kind of, um, but it's mostly, we work mostly on an influence model. So we're not, we're not trying to launch new products. We're trying to work with the people who own the products uh, to influence their decisions. So. Do they? <laughs> no, we, 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 yeah, yeah, we just work internally at Sabre, so the rest of Sabre gets us for free, except they fund our budget. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you all. Appreciate it. Have a good rest of the week. Thank you, Phil. And also tomorrow we'll have Brandon Ward providing a talk on integrating UX into your startup. On Thursday, Randy Kroom will be speaking about visualizing your startup pitch deck. So as you try to convince investors to give you money, how are you going to display that data to them? 
he'll be talking about that. Thursday night, uh, to your question about possibly getting advice, we're going to have a panel of user experience experts providing feedback while it's filmed for the show Expose UX. Three experts are going to give feedback to four different startups, so make sure to come and join that at 6.30 at CoWork. But thanks again, Phil. Really great. Thank you.